See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Everyone who commits sin is a child of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born of God do not sin because God's seed abides in them. They cannot sin because they have been born of God. The children of God and the children of the devil are revealed in this way. All who do not do what is right are not from God, nor are those who do not love their brothers and sisters. Uh, I'll pray for Andy before he starts his talk. Dear God, thank you so much for sending Andy to see you to do the talks tonight. Um, And thank you so much for all the visitors who could come along. Please help Andy to speak clearly and truthfully from your word and help us to understand uh, from all our different circumstances and life um, life stages. We thank you that we can read your word and uh, we pray that we would understand it through the grace of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it's so encouraging uh, to see everyone here tonight. Um, old faces, uh, people I haven't seen for a long time. It's quite encouraging and, and uh, quite moving. And uh, yeah, there were, the, there were people here who were involved with CU um, uh, when the Beatles were still together. That's, that, that, that blows my mind. That makes me emotional that I wasn't one of them. But, um, and that, you know, that there's someone here who's involved with CU and watched the moon landing on television screens in Union House. Can you imagine that? The, yeah, that's pretty amazing. The, the, yeah, so, you know, and there's, oh, there's all sorts of people here. It's very exciting. And uh, it's so encouraging um, to share together as God's people. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, makes me feel the sort of uh, momentousness of, of, the, of the occasion, I guess, is that we're thinking about this really important topic of knowing the Father's love, which is a great privilege of uh, the Christian life. And uh, people at, at Summit have been going through 1 John using the manuscript discovery method. Some of you, when you're at uni, Maybe all of you when you're at uni uh, did that. So going through the unmarked text of as close as we can to the original without it being in Greek. It, we, we've given them an English translation. That's the only concession. But they've got a text with, uh, that's unmarked, no subheadings. And every day in small groups, these guys have been reading through 1 John again and again. So uh, everybody's sort of uh, working hard at the text of 1 John. And uh, we will be looking at the passage that was read out tonight, but also diving into some other passages as well. Um, Really, as we think about this theme, uh, one of the key themes of 1 John, knowing the Father's love. So that's just to explain the approach a bit. So it'd be good to have a Bible uh, with you or a a device that has the Bible on it. I have a, a, a little light here on the lectern, which indicates to me when anyone's checking Facebook on their phone. So just be aware of that. Uh, it's one of the thing, one of the new things we've brought in with, with CU, one of the modern technological engagements that we have. But uh, yes, yeah, so please have your Bibles open or share a Bible with a student next to you or a device. And if you're a student, you can be trawling through your manuscript uh, of 1 John as well. Uh, yeah, it is a big topic. Uh, thinking about fatherhood is a big thing. I am a father of four children. Uh, some of you were fortunate enough to meet them today when they visited. Lucy, Chloe, uh, Molly and Samuel and, uh, and Ness, my wife, they were here today. And our dog Leo, who's not one of our children, but is part of the family. I'm a child of an earthly father who's actually uh, 
here tonight. So I, I, I feel even more heavily the responsibility to teach faithfully about the fatherhood of God. And I want to start by doing a little bit of theology uh, of fatherhood, which might feel a little bit heavy at the start, but I think it will help us as we come to receive God's word again from 1 John. So I hope you can come with me uh, on this. Uh, you will have received an outline if you don't have a booklet. That's like a roadmap to the talk uh, that will help you. If you're using the booklet, you need the outline on page 40. Page 40 is the outline for this talk. So Jesus, of course, taught his followers to pray, Our Father in heaven. Jesus loves the Father, and the Father loves the Son, and the Son came into the world to show us the Father and to express the Father's love to us, and more than that, to make us children of his Father, to make his Father by nature, ours by adoption and rebirth through his Spirit. The highest privilege of the Christian life, J.I. Packer says in his book, Knowing God, which I said to students this morning that you, uh, you, technically you can't graduate from any university unless you've read it. Uh, and there's still some for sale on the bookstore, so make sure you get that. But, but he says this is the highest privilege of the Christian life, to be able to call God Father. So I'm going to lift out some quotes from Packer's book, Knowing God. And if you're not convinced to buy it, uh, yet you will be, I think, by the end of these quotes. So he writes, you sum up the whole of New Testament teaching in a single phrase. If you speak of it as a revelation of the fatherhood of the Holy Creator, in the same way you sum up the whole of New Testament religion, if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's Holy Father. Again, he writes, adoption is the highest privilege the gospel offers our redemption and justification a means to that end. Again, he says, throughout our life in this world and to all eternity beyond, God will constantly be showing us in one way or another more and more of his love and thereby increasing our love to him continually. The prospect before the adopted sons of God, that is using that phrase in terms of sons and heirs, is an eternity of love. God receives us as sons and daughters and loves us with the same steadfast affection with which he eternally loves his beloved only begotten. There are no distinctions of affection in the divine family. We are all loved just as fully as Jesus is loved. And finally, what will make heaven to be heaven is the presence of Jesus and of a reconciled divine father who loves us for Jesus' sake, no less than he loves Jesus himself. To see and know and love and be loved by the father and the son through the spirit in company with the rest of God's vast family, which we get a little bit of a taste of tonight, don't we, is the whole essence of of the Christian hope. Remember from last night, eternal life is designed for the enjoyment of that love. Hebrews 2 teaches us that Jesus brings all God's sons and daughters to glory through his humiliation, through his death, and we become part of God's family. It tells us that Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Hebrews 2 verses 10 and 11. Jesus is our older brother. On the night before he died, he gave this teaching. In fact, he prayed for us. This is something that uh, Rob has already shared with us in his talks. It's a passage we'll uh, continue to come back to, I think, as we think about the theme of love, because it lies, it, it really expresses the love which is at the heart of the universe that we as God's people are caught up in. So here is what Jesus prayed for those who would believe. My prayer, this is John 17, verse 20. John 17, verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. That is for his disciples at that point. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, through the apostles' word, the scriptures, what we have received tonight, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Hear what Jesus is saying there through our faith in Christ that is receiving that word of the apostles, that scriptural word and trusting in Jesus who it's all about and by the power of his spirit, we are caught up into the eternal group hug of God from eternity to eternity, the perfect love of God in Trinity. We are given a permanent place at the Father's table, a permanent room, Jesus says earlier in John's gospel, in the Father's house. Think about the way that the prodigal son was welcomed home and celebrated and honoured. That's what awaits all who are the children of God. Every single believer in Christ. You don't just get a tour of Buckingham Palace or the White House or even a sit down invite to a state function or even a knighthood. You become an heir to the throne. You have a permanent place in the royal family. Remember Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy in C.S. Lewis's Narnia Chronicles, Kings and Queens of Narnia. A while ago, I went to uh, a funeral of a, uh, an old uh, a friend of our family from the church where I uh, grew up, and I, ha- I hadn't seen a lot of the older people there for a while, and so they discovered I now had kids. And one uh, gentleman in particular who I've known since I was a child uh, was very interested to know that I now had children, and he said to me something that at the time I thought was a little bit clunky. It's not the sort of thing I thought you just said straight out, but old people are allowed to do that. The older you get, you just say stuff and it's, you can do that, you know. Even at the tender age of 46, I, I'm just, I'm taking that liberty. I'm just going to say stuff now. <laughs> but he said, Andrew, you know that, fa- Andrew, you know that fathers are really important. Fathers are really important. I thought, well, that, that's a bit heavy. I'm just talking about At first I thought it was a bit weird, but increasingly I've come to agree with him. Fathers do great good, but of course uh, we know that in a fallen world they also do the worst kind of damage. In the Sermon on the Mount teaching about prayer to our Heavenly Father who loves us, Jesus said, you who are evil know how to give good things to your children. How much more your Heavenly Father... Just, I know it's not the main point there, but see Jesus' assumption is that even the best human fathers, unlike our perfect, loving and holy and wise Heavenly Father, even the best human fathers are imperfect, evil, actually. Jesus' doctrine of sin is, is very clear and very strong. You who are evil know how to give good things. But that means, of course, that for some of us who've been damaged by our earthly fathers or people who we're reaching out to with the gospel who've been damaged by earthly fathers, when we talk about God, isn't it great that God is our father? Even just that, that's a hard thing to hear. It can be a painful and difficult thing to think of God in those terms. Then again, for those of us who've had Wonderful fathers, and of course, I, you know, I'm in that category. You, you, you meet him later on, see how wonderful he is. Uh, we may not see the need of knowing God as father. I've got a great, I've got a great father, you know. I, I've got a great family. Well, here's another quote, which wherever we're coming from, uh, we might find helpful. And this is from uh, another CU alumni. Uh, Andrew Moody, who's not here tonight, and I reviewed his book this morning in light of the sun. Another book that you need, we need to make sure we sell out of these because it's a great book uh, before the end of summer. And uh, he writes about God's fatherhood and our fatherhood in a, in a very helpful way. I'm going to read to you a bit from this. He writes, the most important thing for us to realize is, is that there is only one true father. 
The frail and fallen men we call by that name are only echoes and shadows of him. Only God shows us true fatherhood. Only Jesus shows us true sonship. If our experience of human fatherhood has been disappointing or painful, the very good news is that there is another and better father to whom we can turn. God is not like our father. He is the true father our fathers failed to be. And this is true for those who've grown up in happy families as well. Even at their best, human fathers are only a shadowy reflection of the true father. Human fathers aren't good enough to love their children consistently or wise enough to know them truly or strong enough to look after them properly. We are all in one way or another children of dysfunctional families. If your father was disappointing or awful, turn to the father of Jesus And meet the one who loves completely and perfectly. He is, as James puts it, the source of every good gift, every perfect gift. He is the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He loves his eternal son with a pure and infinite love. And if you belong to that son, he loves you with exactly the same love. If your father was a good father, if he was patient and strong and wise, and if he loved and encouraged you, don't stop there or make him an idol. Direct your gaze to the father who is the truth behind the very idea of fatherhood. Ephesians 3, 14, 15, look at it later. Thank the true father for these blessings and learn to bask in his love. Let all those good things that you experienced from your earthly father lead your heart to God. Well, we're going to turn to our true kind and loving heavenly father now by receiving christ's word again through his apostle john but first thought it would be good for us to have a reminder and for those who maybe haven't read one john uh, lately a bit of a reminder of the approach that john takes uh we've been spending a bit of time in reading some stuff uh, that God wrote through Paul in first semester, 1 Corinthians. John writes very differently, we've discovered, for example, to Paul. Uh, he, he's, we've discovered that John is an absolutist. Uh, it's light or dark. You are for Christ or you are antichrist. You are child of God or child of the world and so of the devil. You either walk in righteousness or do deeds of lawlessness. There's these polarities coming through uh, in his teaching there. Uh, And that, that I think, comes out um, strongly in the reading tonight. Uh, A verse like this, chapter 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because God's seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. John the Absolutist. John also writes this letter to give these, uh, these Christians assurance and encouragement and certainty. That comes out in a number of places that we've been discovering in our, in our small groups. So, for example, in chapter 2, verse 21, he, he tells us why he writes, I don't write to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it and because no lie comes from the truth. Or later in that chapter in verse 26, I'm writing these things to you about those who are trying to lead you astray. So there's a, a pastoral situation going on in the background here where, where people have left this church and, and that's unsettled the confidence of those who have stayed. And, and even more clearly, uh, of course, in chapter 5 and verse 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. John, the absolutist, who writes to give them certainty, assurance of their life in Christ. And the style, I said last night that John writes a bit like a, a, an impressionist painter, like Turner. Uh, he, you've got to stand back. You've got to get a feel for the themes. If you get right up close to one of Turner's paintings, it's just like splotches of, of colour. Where does one colour start and one end? And how does it, You've got to stand back and, and get the feel for it. You've got to do that with John. You've got to get the feel for the themes. He wants you to hear these truths again and again. He wants you to marinate in them. He wants you to see how they inform and connect to one another, how they fit together 
uh, as facets of one comprehensive vision of the Christian life, as Carson puts it. But of course, it's a bit boring just talking about paintings. Paintings, uh, uh, unless you're doing art history or something, but paintings ultimately are for looking at, and uh, that's what we need to do with the Bible. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. We need to feed on his honey sweet word. We'll see clearly if we listen clearly. So let's go back to chapter 2 and verse 12. And I'm going to start with a section from there. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. When everything's going okay, you don't need to tell a baby uh, when they need to uh, eat. They tell you. They scream the house down. Uh, they, they want one thing, thing, they want milk and they want it now. And you don't have to tell a baby Christian, a new Christian if you like, to share their faith, <laughs> to read their Bible, to, to pray or to hang out with other Christians or uh, turn up for a faculty Bible study. Um, usually they, they turn up to five and you sort of say, whoa, whoa there, whoa there. But after a while, we can, as Christians, become a bit like sulky teenagers. And we get, we get a bit embarrassed by the enthusiasm of our new siblings. Let's just simmer down. Uh, you know, we start to take God and his word, maybe being part of his family for granted a bit. Yeah, child of God. Yeah, yeah. We learn how to be embarrassed about being a Christian. Ingenious ways to, to hide the fact that we're reading our Bible on the tram, you know, and, and, you know, the baby Christian is reading it out loud and evangelizing the driver and we're sort of <laughs> in the corner. Sulky teenage Christian asks, oh, do I have to, do you, does a Christian really need to, you know, go to be part of a church every week and, and, you know, read their Bible every day? Baby Christian doesn't understand what they're talking about. What? Why, why do you have a problem Older, older, wiser Christian, though, gets excited, don't they, when they meet new siblings, signs of, of life, the family. Like on a good day, I enjoy all the noise and chaos of family life at home. We need the shake-up to remind us of our first love, of the privilege, of, of the responsibility of our true identity as children of God, as members of his family. And these verses I think is John reminding them of the objective truth of whether they feel it or not and whatever other people are telling them of the reality that they are children of God. So how does, how does John understand what it means to be a Christian? Well, he describes Christians here as people whose sins are forgiven in Christ, as, as people who uh, know God as Father through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're people who've received and accepted the truth of God's word through believing in Christ. We are people, he says, who have overcome the evil one in Christ. This is who God's people really are now and forever, who we belong to, men and women, boys and girls who believe in the Lord Jesus, who are known by and know the eternal God. Through Christ's victory of the cross, we have overcome the evil one. He has no claim on us now for the, the sin which once condemned us is forgiven. It's washed away through Jesus' death for us. Remember chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And wonder of wonders, we know we are children of God because when we pray, we address God not as some distant, mysterious, maybe he might hear me force, but as our loving heavenly father who we trust, who promises to hear and answer us when we pray. But in case you're feeling a bit like a, a sulky teenager tonight, and that can happen strangely at any age, uh, we get this great reminder 
in uh, chapter 3. So let's go to chapter 3. This was the reading we had read out. Chapter 3, verse 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, it might seem obvious uh, for you, a truism, but John says Christians are called God's children because that is what we are. I, I, I love singing that song, Yes, I Am. Yes, I Am. That, that's such a great, I, 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 yeah, I really, that's an encouraging song. <laughs> that is what we are. That's really important. It, it's not like, okay, there's a group of people who like being together or, you know, they've, they've shared a lot of important experiences. Maybe they've gone on a life-changing road trip. So, yeah, we're all brothers and sisters, man, because we've had this great experience or... It's just like, it's sort of a cool thing to say, you know, yeah, brothers, man, yeah, sisters, yeah. Or we, you know, sort of getting into some of the 1970s CUS here, he presents, getting a bit excited. Or, or we feel particularly close to this person because we've got a lot in common with him. Yeah, that's my brother from another mother, man, you're right on. Or, or it seems like a nice way to think about God and the brotherhood of man or something. No, no, no. It's, it's not that he's like our father, so we're like brothers and sisters. God is our father. We are God. God's children and fellow believers are our brothers and sisters because God has poured out his love for us through his son who died for us. John is excited. This is wonderful. This is a, a miracle of God's grace. We share the same faith in the same Lord and Savior. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one family, a new status before God. We belong to God, our Father. This is our true identity, an identity that also, as John makes clear, determines our destiny. See, the, the false teachers and those who are following them who'd left this community of faith, seem to have made John's readers feel inferior in some way. John writes to reassure them, there is no greater privilege than that of being able to call God Father. And that's what you do. We may not look any different to people around us or seem all that impressive. Most of the time, I think the church doesn't seem that impressive at all actually but this is who you are and who you are becoming the call is to be who you are for when Christ appears John writes and we see him as he is we will be perfectly transformed by that vision we shall be like him when Christ is revealed in his glory we will be revealed in glory with him as Paul puts it in Colossians 3. See, this was God's goal in giving us eternal life, to renew us in the image of his son, to fill the earth with true image bearers who worship him in spirit and truth. Image bearers who are members of his family and so who bear the family likeness. That is, whatever we look or feel like now, whatever the world that is, those who oppose God and his people say about Jesus and his people now, our identity, our destiny is objectively true because it's achieved by God's love, which he lavished on us in his son, Jesus. I've been uh, present at the birth of four human beings uh, my children, be pleased to know, are all human beings. <laughs> and um, it's, it's, uh, I was an art student, but I do know that a, a, a child is no less human than when, if God wills, that child grows up to be 90 years old. Uh, uh, fully human, there, there, is that, there is that child, fully human, uh, even though they, they don't know how to put a... Uh, a record on the record player yet or other things that are necessary to sustain civilization. They are fully human. Uh, uh, 
and the 90 year old is fully human and no, neither is the, the older one is not more human than the younger one fully fully human that's true of the the the, the new christian complete in christ and the old christian because it, it's through god's gift of grace jesus said to the thief on the cross today you will be with me in paradise now when Lucy was born, our first daughter, she got a jumpsuit that they'd uh, embroidered Pride of Prido on the back of, which was cute. It's, it'll become a family heirloom now, I guess, if we can ever find it again in the back of the cupboard, which is like a TARDIS that um, <laughs> um, just keeps going back there. But she didn't, she didn't even know what those letters corresponded to. Um, she couldn't even turn it... Well, not many people can do that, but she couldn't <laughs> do that. Um, although Chloe does gymnastics and she, you know, that's, but anyway. Um, but she, she, you know, she didn't understand that concept, but she was and is a Prito, but she needed to grow up into the reality of what that meant with all of the privileges and superior musical tastes and <laughs> unusually short legs and the... <laughs> responsibility that that identity confirms that is yes the child is fully human but you you hope and pray all being well that that child grows up into their identity you get where I'm going with this I hope so otherwise I've just wasted a lot of time um, you expect the child to grow up to be an adult you expect a Christian to increasingly take on the family likeness right not, tr- not pride of Prudo, <laughs> but truth and, and love. And John tells us that, that that'll necessarily lead to two realities that we'll face as Christians in our day-to-day life. Firstly, what we'll increasingly discover is that we are out of place in the world. Uh, as Rob put it in his first talk, we will increasingly discover our weirdness. And maybe in our culture, we're discovering that more and more. Um, And secondly, we will not continue in a way of life that doesn't belong to our new family. Uh, A way of life which is characterised not by love, but by sin. We'll not continue in that way of life, um, being ruled by sin in that way. These two realities are interconnected. Let's see how John unpacks this a bit. So in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, he writes, uh, the re- this is in the second half of the verse, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So that weirdness uh, was there right from the beginning. Uh, verse 7, dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil's been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. What did Jesus say in John's Gospel? Don't be surprised if the world hates you, for it hated me first. Why? Because Jesus comes from the Father full of grace and truth and the world, John's way of saying human beings in rebellion and opposition against God prefers the darkness. Doesn't come into the light for they don't want their deeds exposed. Don't want the boat rocked. It's humbling. It's humiliating actually to be shown by comparison to the perfect man that we are actually part of the sum total problem of the world, not its solution. Oh, maybe Donald Trump, Pauline Hanson, but I recycle. I ride my bike to work every... I'm a vegan. I'm nice to my grandma. I don't swear around the kids. I'm honest with my tax return as much as any other Aussie is. (laughs) Jesus says, do you love God more than anything and anyone else? Do you love your neighbour as yourself? Explosion. Christians look strange and in the West uh, increasingly weird Uh, even offensive in the eyes of the world because we belong to Jesus, because we struggle with our sin and work to put it to death rather than redefine it and explain it away. White lie, it's what comes natural, boys will be boys. We think it's more important if our children have assurance of salvation and grow in the fruit of the spirit than if they're top of the class or own bucket loads of money and get to go to uni. We actually think there's something that's more important that they know God. 
It's like you, you think your friend's a bit strange and then you, you go to their house and you meet their parents and you, you sort of get that other family house smell. You know, every, every, every house has a smell. Uh, the, 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 every family has their own smell. It, it's, just, it, it's just, I think it's just how it is. And you realise these people are stranger than I thought. They smell different. Jesus says here, John says here, the world does not know us because it did not know God. We smell different. You see, when when we've been saved from the dominion of sin, the rule of sin and the world and the devil, the person who is still enslaved as decent and polite and whatever as they appear to be still belongs and is still a child of the world. And terrifyingly, whether they know it or not, ultimately of the devil. For someone who doesn't know God, if, if lawlessness or lies are recognised in personal life, they are most often explained away. You know this when you're talking to your friends and you're talking about money and, and why you earn money or want to earn money maybe or the, the reason why you're at uni to study or the, the way you handle your possessions or the way you talk about your parents or care for unpopular people or the fact that you uh, meet and befriend uh, international students, the way you, you use or don't use alcohol or view friendship, sex and relationships. I mean, that's come out this week. It's different. The child becomes increasingly like their father. This is true of God's children. And this is true, John says, of those who belong to the devil. So we smell different. We're out of place in the world. Uh, John wants to say some other things as well. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Dear children, don't let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Further down in verse 10, this is... uh, This is small print. Verse 10, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. So this different identity means that God's children will not continue in a way of life that is characterised by sin. Their disposition, if you like, will be towards obedience to God rather than a disposition towards rebellion. So on a daily basis, over the course of a lifetime, Christians keep hitting those crisis points with their sin because they've died to sin. They've done the big R repentance. Remember, you can only go one direction any one direction at the one time. You, when you become a Christian, you do the big R repentance. You do the 180 and you go the other way. You can't actually go in two directions at the same time. It's impossible. The big R repentance has happened. They have turned to Christ. But the little R repentance, turning to Christ each day, putting sin to death each day, keeps happening. So for a start, Christians talk about their sin and being accountable to one another. I I haven't had many conversations with my non-Christian friends about that. You know, Christians say things and I've been overhearing conversations. I, I, I'm not deliberately listening in. It's just you, you're all having these amazing conversations, but you think they're normal. You know, stuff like, you know, I don't want this in my life or this is not what God has given me life for or, or I want to love more or I want to learn how to forgive that person who hurt me or, yeah, my, my ambition is to give away more and more money. The, the more I earn, the more I've got to give away. Will you keep challenging me about that when I graduate or... God, in our prayers, I hear you praying things like, God, please help me to be more like the Lord Jesus. If you're a Christian, you think, yeah, 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 that's, that's, but you, you share those kinds of ambitions in, in, in a workplace where, where there are Christians and your weirdness will become very apparent. John says Christians will not sin and they cannot sin. They are new people born of God. That is the life of Sin dragging on into lovelessness, unchecked, lawlessness until inevitable death and judgment. That's incompatible, John says, with the purpose of Jesus' death for us. Christians know this. Chapter 3, verse 5. You know that God appeared 
in order to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. Or verse 8, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Not, not to reach a compromise. He's in the business of new creation, isn't he? New, new heavens and a new earth. What did Jesus say to the woman caught in adultery? I do not condemn you. I forgive you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Remember the baptismal questions, those absolutist questions that you get asked when you're when you present for baptism. Do you turn to Christ? Do you repent of your sins? They're questions that demand a yes or no answer, don't they? Not maybe or Well, sometimes I might like to do that. A Christian has left behind the old allegiances to sin, the world and the devil. It is absolute. They do walk in a different direction, a new direction, uh, uh, the direction of a born again child of God, a Christian. And one day that identity will be perfectly realized in us. God's work in us will be complete. We will be fully conformed to the likeness of our elder brother, our saviour, the Lord Jesus. The struggle and the fight with our sin will then be over when we see Jesus face to face. But in the meantime, John says, you've got to live in line with who you are and your destiny. You know, if you're an art student, you've got to read your Euripides. Don't be doing your Pythagoras' theorem. All right, you've got to... You've got to be who you are. Jesus said, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus, the absolutist. Hashtag family likeness. Is that what you say? I'm not sure what that meant, but I thought I'd throw it out there (laughs) for all those people who know what hashtags are. John says here, following his master, Chapter 3, verse 3, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law, verse 4. In fact, sin is lawlessness, down into verse 6. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Verse 9 says no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they've been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother or sister. Now, the NIV there, as you know from your reading of the NRSVA, I think you're using, uh, Uh, explains that, uh, you know, continues in sin. But I think it is bringing out the sense of the meaning there. Um, Let's listen to Mr. Constantine Campbell again from his commentary, who I think helps to bring, helps to explain this. I'll, I'll read. You can see what you think of what he says. Sin is understood at this point as a disposition or a settled position of lawlessness and wrongdoing. Living in such a way is incompatible with living in Jesus. John is not claiming that believers will be without sin. A perfectionist heresy. Back to chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, chapter 1, verse 10. He who claims to be without sin is a liar. The truth's not in them. Um, but someone living in Jesus, uh, so we don't want to water down what John's saying and, and qualify ourselves into just wishy-washiness. Someone living in Jesus has been cleansed of sin. They've left the old disposition behind. This means that anyone who does live in sin cannot be identified as a child of God. They've not seen him or know him. That is, we can't be with God if we are against him. We can only walk one direction, the slow, steady walk of the Christian life that involves stumbling and getting up again, trusting in Christ's grace. We, we We can't be walking in that direction, taking great strides away. It doesn't make sense of who we now are because of God's grace to us. Whatever the false teachers were saying to John's readers, maybe that they weren't spiritual enough, they, they, they didn't accept their Gnostic teaching, you know, uh, Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. And, and, and um, John's saying to them, you know, on the contrary, you, your faith in Jesus and his death for you that brought you real forgiveness, real cleansing, 
produced a new way of life, Christ-like love, the fulfillment of righteousness in you. This way of life, this family likeness is revealing who you really are. Children of God, not only adopted, but reborn through God's seed by his spirit through faith in Christ. And of course, the chief mark of the family is their love. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What does that love look like? Well, John shows us a number of times in this letter. He certainly shows us in John chapter 4, uh, 1 John 4 rather, which is where we're going to finally land now. So please turn to 1 John 4, verse 7, where he teaches us what this love is. 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our friend, uh, for our sins, for our sins, for our sins. That's what it says. <laughs> Now, I, 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 the first summit I went to, I mentioned, uh, and, and, and there are a number of uh, eyewitnesses to this, and you can verify. At that summit, we had uh, Alistair McGrath speak. That was, that was pretty exciting, although I remember it as a first year being pretty heavy and incomprehensible. But anyway, exciting in retrospect, perhaps. <laughs> we also had Leon Morris, and that was genuinely exciting because I'd, I'd, I'd uh, read... His, his name on the back of books in, in, in my dad's bookshelves. And that here he was in the flesh, the, the, the great Leon Morris. And he spoke from 1 John uh, at my first summit. So as I said the other day, it's an emotional time coming back to 1 John this year. And uh, he, he was someone for whom the, the cross of Christ, the death of Christ was at the centre of his theology. Uh, the, the Ridley of motto, uh, uh, the motto of Ridley, I'm getting my words mixed up. I'm not sure if it's still the motto of Ridley. You can ask Reese Bazant, he's on the faculty there. The cross is the touchstone of the faith. Well, that's true. It's also true here that the cross, Jesus' death for us, is the touchstone, the gold standard of our love. And if it is Jesus' death on the cross which defines love for us, then we can never say, oh, well, I've loved enough. I think I've loved that. That'll do now. Or look, I'll love them when I when I when I know that they, you know when I feel a bit of love when I feel they've loved me first. Or yeah, look, I'll love and serve God's people until, of course, it costs me too much time, money, comfort, reputation. No, no, and no. God's love for us in Jesus meant that God made the first move. He took the initiative. We didn't seek Him out. He came to find us, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. None of us earns the right to be born. Life is a gift of, of God that he gives to us. And none of us has the right to be born again. Life, eternal life, is the gift of God's love. What we have the right to, what we deserve is actually punishment. The wages of sin, what we've earned, is death. And there's no one who hasn't sinned. No, God did not wait for us to come to him. He did not love us because we were lovable. God came to us. God sent his son for his enemies. And here is the memory verse for tonight, folks. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. And yes, I'm going to use that word. There's that wonderful word again, which of course you use every day. It just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> propitiation, propitiation, rolls off the tongue. We'll, 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 come, we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, Leo Morris would want us to use that word. And, but anyway, we'll come back to that. God is love. 1 John 4, 8 and 16 teaches us 
that love originates with him. Love is essential to his being. All of his actions are, are of their essence loving. It is God's nature to love. Remember, Rob reminded us of, of the relationship at the heart of the universe on Monday morning. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in an eternal love relationship. Love pour, forever poured out and forever received, I think, as Newbigin put it. Yes, God is love. God is holy love. Because as chapter 1, verse 5 tells us first, God is also light. And in him there is no darkness at all. Jesus did not condemn the woman caught in adultery. He went back to Zacchaeus' house for dinner. He forgave Peter who betrayed him at the hour of his greatest need. He promised paradise to the thief on the cross. He forgave and transformed Paul who called himself the chief of sinners, whose hobby was to round up Christians to have them brutalized and put to death. And he forgives and cleanses me and you from our sin, not because he turns a blind eye to it, not because God's holiness no longer matters, no, because he took that condemnation for us. God's wrath was turned from us to him, was propitiated, was appeased when he died in our place on the cross. This is God's Holy love in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is the unanimous testimony of the Bible, isn't it? Paul writes, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus said the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the unanimous testimony of Christ and his apostles in fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. Isaiah, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. For the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And God's love which he's lavished on us, love which has its goal in making us his dearly beloved children, changes everything changes everything it gives us a new life to live it reorders our loves as we're hearing again and again in Rob's talks it brings about a life of willing obedience his service is perfect freedom a life set free from the dead end of self-centered living and pride to loving and serving others When we become part of God's family, when in Christ God becomes our father, we share in the family love. So here's some words from Leon Morris from his commentary on these verses. It is one of the New Testament's resounding paradoxes that it is God's love that averts God's wrath from us. And indeed, that that it is precisely in this averting of wrath that we see what real love is. And now he applies it. Christians should love, not because all those they meet are attractive people, but because the love of God has transformed them and made them loving people. They should love now, not because attractiveness in other people compels their love, but because as Christians, it is their nature to love. 1 John 4 verse 11, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. The circuit of love is completed. The circuit of the father's love for the son through the spirit is completed and his purpose for his children is accomplished. When we love and serve and care for one another in that rugged, sacrificial commitment to one another and more on what that looks like, in action tomorrow night in Tim's talk. But now I think we need to pray, don't we? We need to thank God for his amazing love for us in Christ. We need to ask him to help us to know more and more that his fatherly love for us, that we see supremely in the death of Christ for us and more and more share in that love for one another. Why don't you turn to some of the people around you 
and give thanks and pray about some of those things and I'll gather us together with an amen in a moment or two. Please, let's pray together. As God's children, let's come to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Your Spirit made us your children, confident to call you Father. Strengthen our faith, hope and love that we may do with loving hearts what you ask of us and enter more fully the life you have given us through the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. For we ask it in his name. Amen.